microphone should work now. Does it work? It works. Alright. Just gonna finish eating this, and then we'll start. Mmm. Awesome. Mmm. Okie dokie. Hello. Um, hopefully everything can be heard properly. So, welcome to stream. I'm George. I like programming and math and video games. And I like, especially when all of those three come together and get to do them all at the same time. Um, as usual, I love it when people ask me questions in this stream. Ask me a question at any time. If I know the answer, I'll answer it to as much specificity as you like. Um, if you're not watching this live, send me an email or a tweet or post a video or something. Ask a question. I'll answer it. I like that. I like doing that. I may direct you to watch the answer from a previous video, though. Warning. Heads up for that. So today we're doing more... Um, more asynchronous resource loading. Oh, man. I, ha I, d I haven't really gotten much done since last time. Because it's such a big, complicated thing uh it's kind of it's weird it's um uh, see I've, I've got some stubbed in code for for loading vertex shaders and that fragment shaders and that basically works um i mean it's really complex oh my god i've been struggling with it so we're gonna have some fun today basically is what that means it's weird because so you have like, you have your asynchronous resource loader, which can load anything, not just shaders. Um, but then if it's anything like video cardy, which is honestly most things that, um, that you're loading, you then have an asynchronous renderer. So you take your asynchronous resource loader and your asynchronous renderer, you put them together, you get two asynchronous things that are both have to like talk to each other. Kind of, kind of blows my brain. So we're doing that. Did you write your own math library or using something like GLM or Eigen? My math library, I think, predates GLM and Eigen. Or at least I had never heard of those when I started writing my own and I'd never seen them in, in like things. Let's see. Let's see. GLM. I heard it a long time ago. 2004 or five or something like that. That's when I wrote my math library, and um, I wasn't good at enough at math to, <laughs> to release it like this guy did. Uh, let's see. Uh, how would I figure out how old this library is? Go to the first version. When was it released? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he started working on it the same time, around the same time I started working on mine. 
So, <clears throat> and I, I don't know. Momentum, I haven't changed to the, his is probably better than mine. It's just momentum I haven't changed to someone else's, so. This guy's really smart, though. This, um, I, I've, I've seen him a lot of places. He pops up, his name pops up a lot. Uh, what the whole point, what is the whole point of defines like we see, oh, defines like we see right now, uh, to make changing the implementation easier when porting, etc. why not use a design pattern or similar for it? Uh, which designs were you talking about? Sorry, I wonder which does, which defines, um, did you mean? Uh, I think this is the screen, or wait, maybe this is the screen that you were talking about. You were talking about these defines. These defines are weird, and they have to do with my... Yes, I think you're talking about these defines. They have to do with the way that my, um, my memory allocator works. Uh, oof. This, this is gross, and I need to get rid of it. I'm not going to do that right now. This, this, this define is bad. But, um, so, the way my memory allocator works is it, it, every, the idea is that every, um, memory invocation has a unique signature, and then the allocator is like a system that looks all, at all those, those invocations individually, and tries to discover patterns in them, and then creates, and then, like, pre-computes what your memory layout should look like, and then each individual allocation point um, has reserved memory for it. And so if you, like, if you create a string on the stack, use this local T string, um, and then it creates an individual allocator for that particular point on the stack by hashing the file that the thing's in, the function's name, the line in the file, maybe not the line in the file. Um, oh yeah, because it's already unique, like you have to, to the same name. So like, yeah, it takes all of this information, you know, puts it, puts it get together and gets a unique uh, identifier for that individual allocation. And so that way, whenever you run your program, it remembers how much memory you allocated last time and it's got it there for you. So you call a local T string and it's like, oh, I don't even have to allocate anything. It's right there. And you can't really do that without um, preprocessor junk. Preprocessor is preprocessor is gross, and you shouldn't use it. Um, but sometimes you're just forced to. There's another way to do something. So uh, in this case, I had to use the preprocessor uh, instead of patterns, design patterns. Design patterns are good, I guess, but uh, sometimes they're just not the right tool for the job. So already two great questions at the beginning of the stream. I'm going to um, start digging into this. <laughs> uh, feel free to ask more about that if you want. So let's see. I have a resource loader here. Um, let's actually, let's do this. Here's the debugger. Do, do, do. Let's put a breakpoint somewhere and see if we can, and, and like trace the whole, this will help me organize it in my mind because I've been struggling with this thing. So, wait, not this. So maybe if I just step through the whole thing, resources, and we'll just see what each piece does. I'm gonna put some breakpoints in each part Hello, person, SHB, how are you? Why the const expert in the operator? Oh, why indeed? That's kind of silly, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know why I did that. That's dumb. <laughs> uh, const expert implies const. Probably I added const expert after the fact. So that's, <laughs> that's probably why, good spot. Const. Oh wait, no, this const I need. So this const right here is part of the type of the return value. Uh, I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna need to stick with that. Uh, but this const over here is unnecessary. I'm pretty sure. 
I don't have test cases for this T-string because it's <laughs> uh, trivial. Uh, it's just a, it's just a really simple string class. But yeah, this is all compiling. <laughs> if it compiles, it works. So I so yeah, I'm pretty sure that const expert implies a const function. So I didn't need that other const on the right, but this const right here. You're right, that does kind of look silly. Most of the time you'll see like um, value type or something like that. If you look in, if you look in the, let's, uh, uh, which way do I go? This way, std string. Then you'll see a bunch of type defs and one of them should be value type or something or care type or something like that. Uh, here it is value type. And so that's, that's defining like the value of my string type is either care or it can be w care or u16 or u32 it'll be whatever this is right so you won't see the const there or i guess it might be like const it'll probably const iterator is what the, yeah that's what it'll do const iterator i think is what the operator is that right well we just go see There it is. And oh, const reference, yeah. It, duh, of course, the reference. So it would return a const reference instead of the const care like that. But my string class is like super simple. I don't want to get too generic with the template stuff. So I just have like really dumb const care hard coded. And if I need to do something else, then I'll, you know. Okay. So let's step through this guy. Play, 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 play. That did not fire any of the, what? Why, did, why didn't my breakpoints fire? That's sad. All right, something's not happening properly. Uh, so here's our first problem of the night. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. I think I fixed that though. So I had a bug that made me do this, but I think I've fixed it. Did I check it in? <laughs> I did. All right. I did this crap here to try and find the bug, but I think the bug's fixed now. So I can undo that crap. <laughs> Pretend you didn't see that. Um, so press play on that guy. There we go. Now I got some break points. So let's step into that all right so we're gonna load the vertex shader load vertex shader calls this generic load asset function that loads any assets um so what we're actually gonna do is this is all asynchronous uh we're actually not gonna load anything we're just gonna start an asynchronous read so that's what this does it pushes a new async read to like a list of async reads that i have it constructs it, you know, this function up here. Um, this is all the stuff we did last week. Uh, probably pretty boring, I'm not gonna go over it again, but um, right, it, it, it just creates an asynchronous reader f uh, from the operating system. Um, and then uh, oh, it, it assigns the type. In this case, the type is vertex shader. So it's it's loading a vertex shader. So then at some point later on, Gonna enable this breakpoint right here. At some point later on, okay, well, we're gonna load a bunch of more. We're, so we're loading every, we're just gonna load every vertex shader and fragment shader at the beginning of the game. So all of those get loaded all at the beginning of the game. Sometime later, um, every frame this load com load completed reads is called, and then it goes through all of the, the, the things in that list. There should be a bunch of things in that list now. Come on, come on, come on. How many things are there? Seven. Okay, I have seven shaders in my game. Um, so it's going through all of that, those asynchronous tasks. And it's saying, okay, this one completed. Okay, so what are we going to do with it? Um, let's see here. It's a fragment shader, so we load a, we call a specialized function for loading fragment shaders. 
Uh, so this is where we get to use the format stuff that we did in the first few videos. Um, the reflection system that I decided wasn't actually a reflection system, but is actually just a file format library. So you see here, we're just we're we're taking that buffer um, that I wrote before using this file format library. We're loading it into the library, and we get an instance. Um, and then this instance should have all of the all of the information about the shader in it. Uh, so let's see here, shader profile. All right. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't have it. I'm not going to be able to inspect it. We're going to have to. Yeah, we're going to have to dig into it. All right. So that returns a value. Here it is. So you can see this is my tone map shader. I don't know why that one finished loading first, but that's the one that happened to finish loading first. So my tone map shader finished loading first, and we're going to um, get the code, and this is the length of the code, and we're gonna pass that into the render. This will take a little bit of, uh, create a memory view, okay. So now we're in the render. Now the render works the same way as the, that's what I said before, as the resource loader did. It also works asynchronously. So it's gonna just immediately generate, just generates an ID for the for the thing that I'm loading, fragment shader ID. Um, but then it makes a command and shoves it onto this command buffer. And then that's all it does. It just queues up commands. And then later on in the, in the program, it's gonna be the same thing as the resource loader. It asynchronously um, creates the, compiles the shader at a later time. So let's come over here and set a breakpoint for when that happens. Okay. Um, so let's see, it's gonna make a load fragment shader command uh, and then push the ID that we just generated and then it, it will duplicate the memory of all the code that I passed in. This code right here is the, should be my actual Shader. Can I can I show it in memory? No. Xcode.m memory. There it is. My tone map. My tone map shader. Okay. So it copies the memory. So it has its own copy of the memory, so that the the program that called this the resource loader can free the memory. So I have my own copy here in the render. Um, push all those commands on the render buffer. And then off we go. So much later in the program, okay, it's still it's still reading other shaders off the drive. Okay. And what's this? What's this? Load vertex shader. Uh, yep. Okay. So it's still reading shaders. Good. So now we're processing the command buffer in the renderer. Now this is happening on another thread, right? So now we've jumped threads. We're in the render thread now. And. Uh, so the, in the render thread, we're saying, okay, we got the command. Here's the command. Here's the code. Here's the, okay. Same as before. Nope, maybe not. Command, uh, M code. There we go. So here's my uh, tone map shader. Sitting there in the memory. Um, it's now been passed to the render thread and the render thread is gonna say, okay, Compile it, right? So now we're finally at OpenGL. <laughs> it's like if you just naively write a write a game from scratch, you don't write any of this stuff, right? You just write a load fragment or like a compile fragment shader function. And you dump all this code <laughs> into it, and none of that other stuff existed. If you want to do asynchronous, it's a lot harder. So that's 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 what we're getting into here. So now finally, we 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 can load the the fragment shader. Okay. So we compile it, uh, everything everything compiles fine, good. Um, we create this fragment shader object and push it onto it like the renderer needs to hold its own list of fragment shaders. Okay, so we just take all this information um, and dump it into this list of fragment shaders. So that's good, so that should work fine. Um, taking out these breakpoints, in fact, I'll take out all breakpoints. Well, that's a lot of breakpoints. And run that. Oh, 
Looks like one of my shaders didn't compile properly. Which one? My model shader didn't compile properly. Use of undeclared identifier G up. Well, that's interesting. Let me take a look real quick at the model shader. Uh, yeah, G, G up. That is weird. Where do I get that thing from? Shh. Calm down, dog. Calm down. Calm down. Uh, okay, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, we're just gonna ignore that for now. Okay, so now here we have a running game. Ooh, someone added me to their friends list. We have a running game. Uh, it's not doing anything, right? Because I've just I'm, I'm not even linked the shaders together, but it's running, and I'll prove to you it's running by pressing escape, just like I did last time. Eh. So something happened, right? So when I press escape, I have the thing. Um, <laughs> tear down everything, right? Like tear down the render, tear down the resources. And what I'm working on right now is um, the, the this is the render, we're looking at the render, and the, and, and the like OpenGL component sees that it didn't, you didn't free a bunch of the shaders. So like you have to say, hey, I don't want that shader anymore so they can free it. Somebody didn't do that and um, and therefore, I get this assert. Okay. Um, so, like, I got the whole chain from beginning to end where uh, we're compiling shaders. Like, we, you know, we ask the asynchronous resource loader, hey, load my shaders. And then we wait for it to do that. And we send it to the render. And the render puts on the command queue. And the commands run. And then OpenGL. All that is done for just shaders, but code's not done because you have to do all this resource management stuff. You know, you have to you have to not only be able to create things, but also be able to destroy things. So I've only done half of the work. A lot of work to display a black screen, yeah. Yeah, again, like if I weren't trying to do it asynchronous, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it asynchronous because I've never done that before and it's, it's turning out super fun and I'm learning stuff. Um, it would be a lot easier if it weren't asynchronous because I just, like, if it's not asynchronous, this is all the code I need <laughs> to compile a shader, right? I don't need any of that other stuff we saw. So, um, so here we are learning things. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, so I want to, I want to also have this um, resource management code where, you know, I decide at some point where I don't want this shader anymore and I destroy it and I do that before I tear down my render. Uh, and that's what I'm going to attack tonight. Not the sexiest thing that we can attack, of course. Um, but, you know, like, I'm going to maybe rant a little bit about this. We're all programmers here. Uh, oh, you know what a shader is? That's a really good question. I'm going to pretend that was a question and answer it. <laughs> um, here's a shader right here. It's a little program that runs inside the GPU, okay? So for every pixel on the screen, um, you have to decide given all of the information that you that like the game has, what color should that pixel be? And that's what a shader is. That's what a, that's what a, um, yeah, that's what a shader is, right? Um, so here's a fragment shader right here. You, you see what kind of information we might have. For example, we might have a diffuse texture. Uh, someone's talking to me for some reason. You might have a diffuse texture, um, a value for the ambient light. You have the normal of the... You have the normal of the, of the surface being rendered, you have the texture coordinate, you have all this information, and then you do some processing, and then at the end of all that processing, you spit out a color. So, you know, I sampled the, well, it should look like this, I don't know why, uh, I guess I never got to textures. You sample the texture at this point, some, and it looks something like this. 
uh, if you've never seen shaders before, then you probably don't know what's going on here. But um, the idea is you say like, there's a texture and you pick the point on the texture that this fragment represents. Then you do some lighting calculations, just some really lighting calculations, simple lighting calculations here, I'm not gonna get into, but these are all lighting calculations, dead simple ones. And then um, you combine those together, you return it, bada bing, bada bam. That's a, um, that's a shader. It, re it takes all this information and returns the color that pixel should be. So that's a fragment shader. He means there are other types of shaders that deal with actual geometry fed into the graphics card. That's true. That's true. This is a fragment shader. Um, so, so right here. So another type of shader is, this is a vertex shader. Uh, whose job it is to do something similar. Uh, instead of deciding what color something should be, it decides what position a vertex should be. In instead of the color of a pixel, it's the position of a vertex, right? So first you run your, there's a whole pipeline. In fact, I explained this pipeline in my videos. If you look down this way, um, you should see my Math for Game Developers videos. And I have a whole series on rendering and it explains like, you know, the the purpose of all the shaders, the vertex shader comes first and it decides where all the triangles are and then the fragment shader goes after and it draws the triangles in the location that the in the, the vertex program decided. So you need um, you need all these shaders in order to render anything because, you know, I, I, I have a black screen because I, <laughs> I don't have my shaders up yet, right? So there's nothing to draw, so it's black. Uh, so shaders are really step one when you're doing this stuff. Yeah. T Basic shaders are vertex and fragments. Um, you get other stuff, compute shaders, geometry shaders, etc. But I'm just I'm just starting with the simplest stuff here for sure. Cool. That's a good question. So where was I? So I was about to go on a rant. That's where I was. <laughs> so it's really fun to um, to build things, like to build features uh, as a programmer, but Like, you haven't really done the work until, like, your teardown process is is also correct, right? Like, you, you can create a thing, but you can also destroy a thing. Thinking about all of those edge cases and being very completionist about your, um, about the, your implementations. Completionist is maybe, <laughs> it's kind of a video gamey term, but, like, fleshing out all of your implementations completely, I think, is an important skill for a programmer to have. You don't really have it at first. Like you're at first, you're just trying to get things to work. But in order to build stable and high quality software, you have to do both sides. Um, so it's not very sexy because the hard parts, the hard part is already done. The interesting part is already done. Um, but it's really important, you know, to because someone else is gonna come and use this code and they're gonna be like, I can't destroy things. This is useless, right? So so let's do that, let's work on that. Okay. Um, oof, how do we do that? So let's start here. Uh, not here. The fragment shader returns this ID right here. And then at some point, where was it? V2BF, the, the OS will clean up. That's true. That's very true. Um, I use Sublime, this, this, uh, it's my camera cutting out. I use Sublime, this is, um, this is a great editor. I love it. Uh, I, you know, I, use, I even use it on Visual Studio. So it's, it's actually, when you combine it with CMake, CMake will write out the, um, the build files for it so that you can command B and it builds everything for you. So that's sublime for you. Oh, or, or this guy is uh, Xcode and CMake also prints out. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you said that OS will clean up stuff is tongue in cheek. Cause I was about to give you a lecture on it. Because I've had that attitude before. Like if I write, like, depends on what I write. I might just leave it for the OS to clean up. I might do that, but you can't, obviously you can't do that here. So we have this load vertex shader um, command in the renderer. 
You also have a free vertex shader and it accepts as an argument the same vertex shader ID that the load vertex shader uh, command returned. It just words are hard for me sometimes. You just have to, <laughs> you just have to be patient with me. Um, so not here. This is the this is the resources library uh, resources. So ah, see, I'm not even I'm not even st so here. Vertex shader ID. Uh, vertex. I'm not even storing the result at this point, right? You wrote a civilization map editor where the cleanup took ages, so he ditched it. Oof. Yeah. Uh, cleanup shouldn't take that long. <laughs> Obviously. Without looking at your code, I can tell you that probably you were doing some wrong things there. Like, <laughs> um, geez, I can't even imagine why it would, why cleanup code would take that long. There are these problems though, because like a lot of the time, it used to be that you would close Firefox and I don't know, I haven't used Firefox in a while, so I don't know if it's still like this. You would close Firefox and it would take like a minute or two to actually close. Like the window would disappear, but the actual process was still in the background doing something. Like you, you don't know what it, who knows what it was actually doing. Um, and it's because like, they created all these handles and like if you kill the process, the OS will take care of everything obviously, but like, I don't know, what could they possibly be doing? I don't even know. Let's not get sidetracked with that. So we return this vertex ID, vertex shader ID from uh, from the render and we have to actually do something with it now. We have to like store it somewhere so that, let's see if we have a, yeah, yes. So we have a vertex shader handle that we return from the resource manager. Firefox still does that? Oh my God. Well, I don't use Firefox anymore, so. Firefox was so great for so long, but now it's like, I don't even wanna, I don't even care. I'll take whatever standard browser <laughs> the computer comes with. I don't care. Hey, it's, yeah, you, you see me using Safari. Um, so this this handle, the, the idea of this handle is to use um, like uh, um, that thing Casey doesn't like, uh, RAII or, or CADR or whatever it's called, um, which I use very sparingly. Casey will absolutely never use it, but I, I'll use it sometimes. In fact, I, I shouldn't even call it RAII. I'm just gonna call it reference counting. Okay, so this is like a reference counted handle. So every time the handle is created, you get another reference to the resource. And when it's destroyed, you delete a reference to the resource. You just have an integer that goes from zero to whatever, infinity. Uh, had like 400 by 400 tile elements with 10 layers. Oh, each classes and all one, the iteration over all the stuff was quite demanding. Also didn't think how demanding this was, millions of verts. Yeah, for sure, yeah. No, I remember my first project was kind of like that. Um, had really terrible, like I I, did, I remember doing the worst thing. I was like, I'm gonna make my game multi-threaded. It's gonna be awesome. And so I did all the logic in one thread and then I did all the drawing in another thread, except that I had like the game logic stop and pass, when the game logic was, when the logic th thread was done, it would just, pass the entire game, it would like freeze the entire game state and, and copy it all into the render thread. <laughs> like copy the whole game over to the render thread. And then, uh, and then block the game thread and do all the rendering with the copied material. And so not only was I like not, I was, I was slower because I was blocked and because I copied. So it was like the multi-thread implementation was slower than the, I, you know, I was learning. So, what can you do? I was like 14 or something. Okay, where was I? Um, vertex shader handle. So it's like reference counted. I haven't done any of the reference counting yet. You can see it's just empty. I'm gonna do that later. I'm gonna probably end up doing it now, right? Because I need to do that. Anyway, the idea is when it gets to zero again and you can either decide like, hey, free it now, it's at zero. I don't want it to automatically free itself when it goes to zero. That's dangerous. Like, I don't like that. Like smart pointers, if 
all your smart pointers disappear, then the thing they point to will be freed. And I don't really like that. It's implicit. Like, I didn't realize when I was doing my algorithm that the lead in the smart pointer would call cause a cascade of destructors, right? I don't like that sort of thing. So just like, just like we'll set it to zero references and later we'll come along and be like, okay, now's an appropriate time to delete everything that has zero references to it. Um, so that's what we'll do, I think. So we'll return this shader handle when uh, we'll reference count that guy. And then at some point we'll, uh, we'll count all the references. At some point we'll say, okay, all the references are zero, time to destroy things. And then it will call back into the renderer, say, hey, get rid of that thing. So let's do that now. All right. So, 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 so. So the first thing to do is actually do something with this vertex shader ID. Uh, we have to add it. I imagine we have to add it to some kind of list. People liked it though. Still the most downloaded CIF4 tool in its category. Whatever project motivates you to learn stuff and lots of rewrites. That's cool. Nobody downloaded my stuff. <laughs> so props to you. All right. Ooh, this requires some thinking then, huh? So where am I gonna store this thing? I, I don't think I've actually gotten that far. Um, Cause you see my resources class doesn't actually have any any storage other than the async reads. So I have to decide like how to, st cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna have profiles. I never explained profiles, but every shader has a number of profiles. Uh, it has to be compiled for each profile, which is why I have this loop right here. Um, so uh, for every time you call vertex later, you're actually gonna get a bunch of vertex shaders ID, at least one, but possibly some power of two, right? One, two, four, eight, 16, you could have a bunch. Hopefully that number is small, but, um, so you have to like store all of these pointers or all of these shader IDs that you, that you get back. So let's see here. I guess we're just gonna start with something simple like this member T array. So we're gonna make a, an array, uh, resizable array. It's basically the same thing as a vector from stud vector resizable array, but I call mine T array. I wrote a special one. Uh, fragment shaders. And uh, oof. I'm not really sure what I'm doing yet. So see this problem here is that um, I don't like collections within collections and that is what is about to happen because I'm gonna need another thing here that says make an array vertex shader ID, the render. So I have this array of fragment shaders and inside it Oh wait, I'm confusing vertex and fragment here. Let's do vertex first. Vertex shader IDs. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can do this right here. Can I? Maybe not. Okay. Hold that thought. But, um, so like I have an array within an array, an array, in a, an array of an array means you have a problem. Not a big fan of that, but I'm not very practiced at thinking up a good solution for it. I mean, this is a pretty normal practice. Um, because like C++ lets you just write this sort of thing like it's no problem. You can have an array of a map of an unordered hash of a set of another vector. 
And then the problem with that though is you remove an item from the parent vector. And again, cascade of deletions. It can be really messy. Um, so maybe we can think about a better structure for this data that can avoid too many levels here. Or is that even a problem? I don't know. See, this initial code is always slow because it involves a lot of thinking like this. How do I want to structure? It's really easy to screw up in the beginning stages of designing something. Um, and then you have to live with that screw up for a long time. It's a lot harder to reverse a screw up than it is to write it. Uh... Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's just flatten this guy out a little bit. Shader ID. Okay. Uh, so it's, I guess at some point we have to have like a resource ID as well. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but my idea here is to have a sorted vector instead of a, uh, instead of like a, sorry, a sorted vector instead of a, um, an array of arrays. Like you have, you have all of those, all the arrays that would be inside the other arrays are just in line in, in a larger array. And we'll go with that for now until I decide what to do later. So we have the storage problem working. So let's just work on that for now. So we're gonna push back on this guy, which means we'll have a new vertex shader um, so grab that guy and, oh, see, this is a bad name. Shader storage. Something like that. No, do this. No, shader storage. I like shader storage. And then we can shader storage dot pushback. Or wait, no. Oh yeah, we're gonna do it like this. Shader storage, uh, shader ID equals this guy that we got back, vertex shader ID. So let's see what that looks like. Unrecognized token, vertex shader ID, it's right here. VTBR vertex shader ID and namespace VTBR. You know what, probably I just haven't, yeah, that's all it is. I need to do this. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that because it, any now, anytime somebody includes a uh, resource.h, they're gonna get my render, which is no good. So let's do this instead. Let's do this instead, yeah. We're gonna forward declare. Uh, can I even do that with an enum class? I think I can. Forward declare. Good. I always wondered, is there an actual difference between structs and classes except uh, but the default scope I find conflicting info. The only difference between a struct and a class is class something. Struct something. 
implicitly at the top of a class, you have this. And implicitly at the top of a struct, you have that. It's the only difference in C++. That's it. There's literally no other difference that I know of. Um, default By default, classes are private and structs are public. In practice, it doesn't matter because you should always put this here. You should never rely on the implicit behavior. You should always put public, right? Because someone might not know that, that default, the, the implicit behavior. It's always better to just put the... Um, the thing there and then it's explicit and then like you know if somebody goes here you, you can see I I put private here well I guess it's already private but if someone comes here and says then if this isn't here then I then I, it's changed the behavior of the of the thing right so by my own lecturing I should do that <laughs> by my own advice so that's it. And that's a pretty like introduction to programming interview question sort of question. So that one's good to know actually. Um, so good. So now we're, now we're pushing all of our shader IDs onto a list. That's progress. Uh, we're not doing anything close to reference counting though. Let's see. What do I actually return from here? Load vertex shader. Ah, nothing. Yeah, it's empty. Okay. So plain people like structs, I assume. I guess? I don't know what you mean by plain people. Oh, plain C people. Yeah, they like, well, a class doesn't exist. And yeah, I habitually type struct anytime I... That doesn't matter, though. You just... It, you, yeah, you write struct or class, it doesn't matter because then you write public or private and then it's all the same. Don't mind the distractions at all, by the way. You should see it. Some nights, yep, structs can have member functions just like classes. Structs are identical in every way. Classes, structs can have operator overloads. They can have virtual stuff. They can have whatever. Constructors, destructors. Um, last few nights, or some nights, I've done this. And I, I don't know if you were here. Sean has taken over my channel and like, you know, you suck. I'm going to talk instead <laughs> and like explain some things from his channel through my channel. So um, we get super distracted here and it's fine. So same way the renderer returns this uh, vertex shader ID. I also want to return a, an ID. Um, in C sharp structs can't have void functions which makes it relevant to its purpose, sure. Um, template class T is allowed, but template struct T isn't. Interesting. I actually want to test that. Where can I test that? Do I have a delete me? Actually, let's not do it here. C++. Come on. What the... Compile on the web. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, okay, let's see here. Struct S. Okay. Class C, so what are we? Oh, template class T. So then we'll make a C template S. See if that does anything. Unused variable. Oh, oh my God, really? It's terrible. Uh, okay, so that works fine. So let's do struct. Very cool. But I would say that's not because, um, that's not because, like, like that's not a shortcoming of classes because I can put this here. Like the class itself, I have to reverse these, S, C. 
like the class itself doesn't matter. It's just this class is a this class is a keyword inside template, right? So like you can pass a class or a struct into this thing. It's just you can only say class and type name here. It doesn't really have anything to do with classes or, or structs at all. It's just the keyword is is what I would say. So it's still not a difference between, um, it is a syntactical difference, right? Yeah. It's still not a difference between classes and structs because like what you type here actually doesn't even matter, <laughs> right? Like type name, type name and class are identical. I think that's true. I think type name and class are identical uh, right here. Maybe not. That works fine. Yeah, I think they are. Anyway, that was fun. I learned something. T-I-L. <laughs> so the same way I return some kind of vertex shader ID right here. Um, yeah, you can have, you can definitely have uh, other things other than classes in there. You can have integers, sure. That's fine. But then you would write int T, not class T, so. <laughs> so the same way that my um, render returns a vertex shader ID, I think I want to return a uh, like a resource ID. It's the same thing. And I don't think I have, I've actually defined one yet. So let's do that. Enum class resource ID. Uh, and then I always do this. Invalid equals zero. Wait, no, let's make invalid equal that thing. Is that okay? Looks good. So we're gonna generate a new resource ID every time a resource is loaded. And uh, associate that with this. You can also set default classes like default arguments in templates. Uh, that's true, that's absolutely true. For me, when I look at C and C++ programs, I just can't process it. You know, no, like, I, I, I don't know what um, programming languages you're familiar with, but the first time I looked at C++, it was impenetrable to me to, like, it's, it's not, it's not that, like, it's nothing innate about you that you can't read, C, like, you don't have, it's not that you don't have that circuitry in your brain that you can't read C++ programs or something like that. You just got to look at them a lot, you know, like you're jumping in here and you're seeing like, this is some pretty advanced stuff, but like, if you take it easy, you take it from step one. C++ is no scarier than any other programming language, really. It's maybe a little more complex, um, but it's learnable as, as, as much as any others. Like if you can learn all the crazy JavaScript frameworks that are out right now, you can certainly learn C++ for sure. I'm having trouble translating what I've learned from console C++ to a program with a GUI. Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because C++ has crazier syntax than C Sharp or Java, but all, all of the all the programming logic is the same. So when you learn the syntax, you're you know. So let's see. GUI, I actually remember having this trouble um, translating like console stuff to GUI stuff because GUIs are event driven, basically, right? Uh, and, and you feel like you have control on when you're writing console thing because you start at A and then you go to B and then you go to C and then at the end D happens and then you return zero, right? Like that's your program. But with a GUI, like there's some other thing that has taken control of your program and it just like, you never really know where, you just have callbacks, you never really know where you are in the program, right? It's not linear A, B, C, D anymore. You just like, oh, the user pressed a button, I guess I do things now. Um, which is not very bad, because event-based programming is like an important thing to learn. So maybe the best thing for you is just to dive into some GUI programming and, and, and try and make things and, and, and like see how that works. Um, Right, like it's it's very often it's almost all of JavaScript, 
is event based. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of other languages have, have event based features in them as well. Um, so it's good to be able to think like that, I would say, and, and not be daunted by the fact that some other thing has basically taken over your program and you don't have like a, the, that linear control over it anymore. Oy. Uh, that's a lot of tangents. <laughs> so let's add this resource ID to the resource handle. We should probably make this private. Um, okay, so that we know what ID we're reading. The whole signal system was new to me when I looked into Qt at first and blew my mind, but it's fun though. You know, Qt has a pretty powerful architecture in that sense. Like their whole signal and their like input output system. Um, I don't remember what they call it, but like how everything has inputs and then produces outputs. It's really nice. It's a good system. Best way to get feedback from your program is convert everything to machine code and then convert that to Morse code. For sure, yeah, I do that all the time. That's really, I love, I love that. Morse code. So now when we create this resource handle, we have to generate a new ID. So that's basically just gonna be, um, we'll hold this next, next ID here and we'll start at zero, right? And make a little fun method here to say resource ID generate ID. Uh, we'll worry about filling that guy out later. Actually, let's also write um, generate resource handle handle. Uh, well, MVC architecture is really neat. Assume you're still talking about Qt. I've heard Qt is cool, trying to learn Win API. Oh my God, why would you? Oh, like the, oh, you're probably watching Handmade Hero. <laughs> Ideally, my programs can one run in Windows P environment. Qt should do that for you. Um, yeah. Yep. So we want to generate a resource handle, which will contain a, an ID here, and then should also contain a uh, references count, which starts at zero. Okay, we'll make friend class resources just for convenience. Friend classes aren't the greatest thing, but we're just gonna cheat. I don't really have a huge problem with friend classes. Other people do. So, so at this point, I think we can return, oops. Return generate resource handle. Uh, and then we'll have to Parameterize that by a template uh, type name T. So our ta template is asset type vertex shader. Actually, we'll have to do this first, won't we? So we have to do it first so that because this will this will generate a um, a re, uh, like an ID, and then we're gonna have to pass that ID into the actual function here. So, into this load asset function, because it, it's gonna have to know the ID. Um, so let's see here, vertex shader handle, results. So notice we can create the resource handle without actually having loaded anything because the handle is just that, it's a handle, right? Um, there's nothing in it. 
it's not the actual resource. It's just a pointer to the resource. Meaning that it should be pretty easy for us to um, Like if, if you're holding the resource handle, you don't get the actual resource. That's the that's the whole point of this this resource handle thing. So it's like a decoupling thing. It's just a reference counter. Uh, I'm not doing any of the reference counting stuff yet. We'll worry about that in a moment. So let's see. Let's pass that guy in there, and then return the results. So this will not compile because I have to. I have to do this here and make this say fragment and make this say, in fact, I'm gonna rename all of these to say handle, copy this here. And now we're gonna have to, oh, this isn't good. Oh, this is annoying. So we'll, ju we'll, just, we'll just pass the ID here. How about that? Get ID. That's all we really need. So at load asset, resource ID, uh, ID. Good. So that might compile. It'll give me a linker error at the very least. Oh, weird. Uh, what? Oh, this stupid. See, I guess it does matter, huh? The difference between struct, struct and class. Clang at least wants you to be consistent for some reason, I don't know. Template argument for non-template parameter must be an expression. What? I think I have to do this. Cannot initialize a member sub object of type resource ID with an R value of type int. Oh yeah. So the reason I use enum class is because it has strong typing and it won't coerce to and from an integer. Um, well, but what I what I wish it had, I wish it would, I wish it would convert to and from an integer, but not to and from. I wish I had a type that did this. To and from an integer is okay, but not to and from another integer, another enum. Like that's what I really want. Um, enum class is great, but it doesn't do like this sort of ID where an ID is some kind of integer. You don't, you don't really care what the integer is, but you just don't want your resource ID and your page ID and your character ID and all these different IDs to get confused. Cause if you just type, if you just type this, then you can convert one to another, no problem. And that's no bueno. So. So you just have to convert here, convert. Uh, what's going on here? Get ID doesn't exist, of course, because I haven't written it yet. 